So as we are going through, I'm preaching through books of the Bible, right? We're going through New Testament letters. So far since I've been here, we've gone all the way through Philippians and part of the way through Titus. Letters of the New Testament. Um, the letters of the New Testament from Mark, or excuse me, from Matthew uh, all the way through Revelation uh, are not separated books of individual teachings of, of wisdom gleaned by apostles uh, by their own inspiration. That, that's not what this book is. And I think for most of us in here, we, we understand that. Uh, the whole council of the New Testament and the Old Testament, of, of the whole thing, it, it is God's Word. And therefore, everything is not disconnected, as if we're talking about, um, you know, th this is this part of life, and it's not really connected to this part of life, or, or this teaching is not really connected to this teaching. No, it's all one message. One big message. From in the beginning to Amen. It is all connected. There's one main message and there's one main character, and that's God Himself, Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. It is not just the Gospels that are about Jesus, for instance. It's not just the Gospels where we get to learn about Him. It all points back to Jesus, every bit of it. So where we, hear, uh, we are here in Titus is about church order and structure and, and how we're supposed to call and qualify elders and how we're supposed to live as older and younger men and women and how we're supposed to treat each other. We're like, okay, this is good for the you know, church rules. Now, this points us back to Jesus. Like even throughout the letter, Paul continually points back to Jesus, points back to salvation, points back to, to, the, to the truths of the core of our salvation as if this is an ex, expression of that salvation. How we should order the church and call elders and all of those kinds of things is an expression of our salvation in Jesus. And it is, so it all points back to Him. Uh, in, in Titus, how we're supposed to live and treat each other points us back to Jesus. If it was not for Jesus' coming, as we see recorded in the Gospels, we would not have the example of what true Christian living is supposed to be like. If the man Jesus Christ, the God-man Jesus Christ, didn't come and live the way He did, we wouldn't have an example. Because nobody else can be that example. Everybody else falls short of the perfect standard of righteousness. So yes, Jesus is our righteousness. We are justified by faith in His finished work, both in His perfect life and His perfect death, and not by any works of our own. That is the gospel. God has saved us on His own, by His own, through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We are made righteous in God's sight because Christ's righteousness has been applied to us, and His death in our place paid the debt that we owed. So Jesus is our great God and Savior in both His human life and death for us. Amen. And also, Jesus is our example. He is the exemplar, the standard of what normal human being is meant to be. He's the only one, the only standard. And so the letters that we see to the churches and, and the other books of the New Testament, for example, do not move away from Christ and His work in the Gospels. It's like, okay, well that was about Jesus, now let's talk about the church. No. It, 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 it doesn't move away from it, but what we see is how Christ continues His work in His people, through His means, by His Spirit, in the church, through His Word proclaimed by the apostles. So, uh, this is all, I'm trying to connect it all here. So if you want to know what Jesus is like, if you want to know who Christ is, you must read the whole Bible. Not just the Gospels. For example, the letter of Paul to Titus here, that we're reading, is... Christ's teaching. 
The need for order and structure in the church is Christ's teaching. The need for sound doctrine and godly living is Christ's teaching. Paul taught Titus these things, and we teach these things now because this is what Jesus Christ teaches. We order and discipline our lives in these ways because this is not only what Christ wants for us. As if he stood, it's not as if he's just standing back and giving us orders. He does. He's given us orders. These are orders. Don't get me wrong. They're commands. But he came and he showed us how to live these things out by his example. These things we read are what God does. When we teach the scriptures, we're teaching the example of Christ. When we teach, for example, like last week, be subject to the governing authorities. We are saying Jesus did this and would do this. So we must also do this. <laughs> it's not Jesus saying from up there like, ha ha, you guys have to submit to the government. No, he's like, do it like I did it. Be like me. So subject yourself to the governing authorities because that's how I live. That's my character. That's the quality that I exhibit. That's who I am. Never let yourself forget that the whole counsel of God's word, all of it, is meant to point us to Jesus Christ. As Savior, as Lord, as example, as our righteousness, as the head of the church, as our creator, as our everything. So today's message is, is no exception. And, and all the other messages that seem to be graceless or, you know, separated as if it's just a command for works. No, no, no. These are all connected back to Jesus. As we read this section, as we spend our time focusing on verse 2 of Titus chapter 3 today, remember, this is Jesus' words to us. And these words to us describe what he is like. And so then this perfectly points us to what he wants our lives to be like as well. So would you stand with me this morning for the reading of God's word? Titus chapter 3. I'll read verses 1 through 3 for our context and we'll focus our attention on verse 2. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy to all, toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Father, this morning, teach us what it looks like to be more like Jesus. Reprove us in the areas where we're not. Correct us so that we can grow in holiness. And train us in righteousness for your name's sake. Amen. You may be seated. So last week, our main idea was that God requires his people to submit to, obey, and be ready to do good to and through the state, that is, the governing rulers and authorities. And I would add this little phrase just based on what we just talked about, because that's what Jesus is like. <laughs> and this morning, the message in a sentence, would be this. God requires His people to be considerate to all people. And let me add that little phrase, because that's what Jesus is like. So he says in verse 2, to speak evil of no one. So we're in the middle of a sentence, and we've got to keep that in mind. So this actually, we've got we to go back to the beginning of verse 1, once again, remind them. This is another one of the things that Paul says the church at Crete, specifically here in this letter to, to Titus, needs to hear, and now us, we need to be reminded of today. Now for some of us then, that might mean that this reminding may, may actually be the first time. Maybe you haven't heard these things before. And, and so you're going to be told the first time, but you need to be reminded of them continually anyway. And for, for many of you in this room, uh, you may have read these things, heard these things, uh, taught not just in this one place, because these, these, uh, these phrases, the, this verse here is actually taught in a lot of different places 
in the scriptures. Um, so you've probably heard this hundreds and hundreds of times, but you know what? Repetition is how we learn. That's right. <laughs> so remind them, so we'll start each one of these phrases with that. Remind them to speak evil of no one. Uh, the, the, the word here, the phrasing here, it could, could be uh, translated insult no one or blaspheme no one. That's the, the Greek term is blasphemeo, which is where we get that term, blaspheme. Or to slander no one. In, in Paul's writings in the New Testament, it, that, that word, as he brings it up, and he uses it quite a bit, means to speak against someone or something maliciously. This, this, so Paul is telling Titus, remind the church not to do these things. Not, do not slander. Speak evil of no one. Slander no one. Insult no one. Here's the, here's the thing, church. The one who has been saved by grace, you, who is being saved by grace in sanctification, you, will reveal that this is true in how you speak and act towards others. They will know them by their fruit. Scripture says, in particular, in context of what we're talking about here, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the mouth, our speech then, will reveal if there has truly been a heart change. What's coming out of your mouth? Is your speech full of insults and slander? If so, Paul is saying here, God is saying here to us, this ought not to be so, my beloved. Jesus, again, let's go back to him as the example. Our example never slandered, never blasphemed, never insulted anyone. In fact, we were reminded in 1 Peter this morning, he never sinned at all. He never did this. Though he never did sin in the way that he spoke, it was the religious leaders of the day who actually condemned Jesus to death for what they said was blasphemy. You know what? <laughs> Do you notice the irony there? Like, they blaspheme Jesus by saying he blasphemed, calling God himself a sinner. Now, what's funny to me is if you as I was thinking through this, is if you remember some of the interactions that Jesus had with, with some of these religious leaders, with the scribes and the Pharisees, you, you may think, like, if you really take a second and think about it, you go, well, Jesus actually did seem to insult them. Didn't he? I mean, it seems like it. Listen to some of the things Jesus said. Ready? Matthew chapter 23 is the most concentrated section of, of this. This is the woes. I won't read all of them, but here's a few of them. Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Verse 25. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. Verse 27. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. Wow. This seems insulting, doesn't it? In our day and age, when everybody's offended by everything, like somebody's going to be offended if I stick my pinky up right now. I don't, I don't know why. Ever, sorry. 
you ever been on social media and like somebody, it gets so ridiculous. I've seen people like post a picture of a stick and say, here, here's, argue about this if you can. And then guess what they do? They argue about it. It's funny in a kind of joking way, but that's, that's what happens, man. We, we argue and we slander and we insult. And it's just, we do it all the time. That's our culture. And so, everything's offensive. We take offense at everything. So when we read stuff like this that Jesus said, we're kind of like, ah, Jesus. So then, obviously, if the truth is that Jesus never sinned, and we... And we are clear about that from Scripture. Multiple places in Scripture saying that he has never sinned. He would, you will never find deceit in his mouth. Never. Never sinned. Then obviously our view of this is wrong. Do not slander or insult does not mean you do not speak the truth that needs to be said. Especially to those who should know better. These Pharisees, these scribes, these teachers of the law should know the law. And Jesus calls them on it. They should know better. And so for us as Christians, that's why sometimes what I say to you might come across as harsh. But it's because you should know better. And you need to know better. Listen, according to Scripture, again, Jesus never sinned. So even if we think with our 21st century mind that offending someone with the truth of Scripture is somehow insulting, Jesus proves to us that that is a false understanding of slander and insult. Jesus intended to rebuke and correct by speaking truth about their actions. Listen, someone being offended by the truth does not automatically make something an insult. And Jesus proved that. However, I know what you're thinking, all right. <laughs> I can just be brutally honest with everybody and just be a jerk. <laughs> no. On the other hand, here, here's where it goes deeper. If we speak the truth without love, we sin. Jesus has perfect motives. <laughs> Jesus has perfect purposes. Jesus has perfect intentions of the heart. He spoke the truth in love. And so when we do not speak the truth in love, we are sinning. We are seeking to insult and slander even with the truth. So we have to be careful. The heart behind what we say, again, how we say things and what we say will come out of the heart. So we need to address those heart issues. But listen, it says, blaspheme, insult, speak evil of no one. So this implies that we should have this attitude not only with the governing officials, because again, that's the same sentence, right? Right? beginning of the sentence is verse 1, talking about being submissive to rulers and authorities. It doesn't mean, going back to that, that it should just be speak evil of no governing authorities, which you shouldn't. How many, how many people have bad-mouthed Biden this week? Well, at least you're honest. No one. It, it does mean the governing officials, because that's right there. But it says no one. That's everybody. No, you shouldn't slander anybody. You shouldn't speak evil of anybody. No one. Not one person. At all times, in any situation, whether they're believers or unbelievers, speak evil of no one. There is no circumstance where we are allowed to be insulting and slanderous about anybody. Period. So he says, remind them to speak evil of no one. Second here, and, and these next two, second and third ones, uh, phrases really go together, uh, but they need to be addressed kind of individually here. So he says, uh, second, to avoid quarreling. This phrase literally means be unhostile, be non-quarreling. <laughs> 
Uh, this, this, is, this, this phrase means that there uh, be someone who is not disposed to fight, to quarrel, or to be contentious. This isn't just not that he doesn't quarrel. It's that he doesn't want to either. He's not quarrelsome. This, he, he's saying the, the, to, to, to be the, like this, it, you're not constantly looking for a fight. You're not easily offended. Now this, this word is, is one of those that we talked about back in chapter 1 for a qualification of an elder. So this is also a reminder, reminding you, what we talked about back then, that those qualifications of an elder are not just for the elders. We all <laughs> should be growing to be more like this. Uh, we should uh, all, th those qualifications of an elder represent the character of a mature and maturing Christian that we should all be aspiring to. We shouldn't all aspire to be elders, not to the role. Again, God has specific things in mind there, but to the character of an elder. The regenerate person, the Christian, refuses to, to cultivate in their life and then to, to act on any kind of verbal or physical violence towards people. He's not trying to fight. A Christian, as far as it is possible with him, seeks to live at peace with everyone. Romans chapter 12. And then this third one, remind them to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, and third, to be gentle. This, this word is the same word found over in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5 where it says, be gentle or be reasonable. Be lenient. This, this, this word here does not mean then that you should always be agreeable. Again, Jesus kind of proved that to us back in uh, Matthew chapter 23. What I mean is this, this term does not mean that we should ignore sin or false teaching in order to not be quarrelsome and to remain gentle. Again, this is the attitude of the heart. It is, it is about the motivation behind the, the way that we act and speak. To be gentle, then, is the attitude of humility. It is seeing others as more important than yourself, as Paul told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2. And then just a couple verses later, saying, this is the mind of Christ. That's how Jesus thinks. So when Jesus spoke plainly to the Pharisees that we looked at back in Matthew 23, he was not trying to be unnecessarily quarrelsome, nor was he being insulting. He was humbly speaking the truth of God's word. He was being gentle. He was being reasonable. Now, of course, and this is usually the, uh, the argument, well, I can't be like Jesus. Well, I know you can't completely. <laughs> Now, he was God in the flesh, so he has that, but it still holds true. Being gentle doesn't always mean being quiet no matter what and never saying what God has said for fear of offending. That's the way the world thinks. True gentleness, again, is shown in the example of Jesus. So let, let me give you a different example, not the Pharisee one. That one's fun, just to think about. Let me give you a different example of gentleness from Jesus. In John chapter 4, we get an account of Jesus meeting with a woman at a well. This woman is a Samaritan woman. So she got two things going against her during this time. Jesus greeted a woman, which was not customary at the time, for a man to just greet a woman like that by themselves. But he greeted a woman that his people didn't like. And even more than that, let's take it to another level. He, he met with, greeted a woman, a Samaritan woman, who was rejected by her own people, who others rejected because of her sin and her lifestyle. He engaged in conversation with her 
about life and truth. He cared for her. He was gentle with her. He wanted to give her living water, eternal life. But in order to repent and believe, you must address sin. And Jesus didn't sweep the truth under the rug and say, just come to me, I love you so much. He called it out. He said, go call your husband and come here. And the woman responded that she didn't have a husband. And Jesus knew this. He said, that's correct. For you have had five husbands, and the one you are with now is not your husband. And so the woman, she tried to change the subject. And to argue, to be quarrelsome about the Samaritans and the Jews, uh, about what they argued about uh, in, in those days. Should we be worshipping on that mountain or on this one? But Jesus wasn't there to quarrel. <laughs> he had something more important in mind. He addressed her heart. He told her that true worshippers worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus was there at this well, at this time, to meet this woman to save her. And he did. And she became a witness to her town. The very ones who likely rejected or looked down on her and many in that town came out to Jesus and were saved as well. Jesus is the perfect example of what true gentleness looks like. He was caring and lenient, but direct and committed to the truth. Remind them to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, forth, and to show perfect courtesy. Lord, show, to demonstrate, to manifest. Perfect is not, uh, we've, we've talked about this word in, in, in other settings uh, on Sunday nights, Wednesday nights. I, I've even probably talked about it in, uh, at some point when we got to it in, in Sunday morning. But perfect does not mean sinless. It means entire, complete, full, with, with full courtesy, with all courtesy, with entire courtesy. And that word courtesy means gentleness. Again, courtesy, consideration, to be considerate. Christian lives should be ongoing demonstrations of this kind of gentleness, this kind of courtesy. This, this, is, this is the, again, the humble attitude. It's, it's the quality of not being impressed with yourself. You care about others. You're, you're thinking about other people's needs. You're thinking about their importance, about what they need. And Jesus, once again, is the perfect example of one who continually manifests, man, manifests perfect gentleness and consideration. Uh, one way to think about uh, applying this kind of quality of, of showing per perfect courtesy, here, here's one just, uh, this is a freebie for you to, th to, to consider, because this is one that I, I see a lot. Not here necessarily, but you see it a lot. Again, in our culture, because of the way we are, selfish and, 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 and uncaring, basically, um, this showing perfect courtesy in our day and age may look like this. You don't have to have the last word. When you speak with somebody else, you're considerate to, to their point of view. You let them talk. You're, you're not ready to say something before you've heard what they had to say. You care about where they are and what they believe and what they think. You care about the truth. You're considerate to them. You consider that, hey, your time, your person, your being is valuable. You don't speak over other people. You listen to all of what someone has to say before you try to respond with your own opinion. That's showing perfect courtesy. One way of showing perfect courtesy. 
And lastly, this is not a, another qualification here, but just another reminder. He says, to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Now, I've already mentioned all people, meaning it's more than just the governing authorities in the earlier part of the sentence. It means it, it, it's outward. It goes to everybody. But I want us to think about that for just a second. This, this definitely differentiates the first half of the sentence from the second half. But to all people, toward all people, means not just to the church, not just to the governing officials, but to everybody and all kinds of people. Remember, uh, now it's been a few weeks ago, where, where God saves all types of people? That's that same idea. You, 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 there, there's nobody left out here. We should not treat some people with more courtesy than others, showing favoritism because of some superficial trait like race or social status. James reminds us of that in great detail in his letter. I won't go there. That's what we've been teaching on, that I've been teaching on through James on Wednesday nights. He goes into great detail about that. We don't show favoritism. We're not courteous to some rather than others because of some, again, superficial quality. There really are only two kinds of people in this world anyway. There's believers that are saved, and there are unbelievers who are lost. Saints and ain'ts. There you go, Gary. So while there is definitely uh, biblical grounds even uh, for treating other believers like family, there's a closer relationship. There is a, a, a deeper uh, courtesy that we have uh, for one another as the church. Uh, still, even with that in mind, that doesn't mean that because we're supposed to be overly courteous with our own brothers and sisters, and more so, that doesn't mean we reject everybody else. That's, that tends to be how we think of it. And I don't know why. I don't know where that comes from. But we go, well, I'm, I, I love my brothers in Christ. That jerk over there across the road, though, he needs to get his dogs or I'm going to do something. Why, why are we courteous with people in here and we can't be courteous with the person across the street? You can say <laughs> Because they got dogs, yeah. <laughs> everyone, everyone deserves to be treated with this same kind of, of courtesy towards all people. And so again, like in Romans 12, like it says, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, live with all people in the same courteous, gentle, and peaceful way, no matter who they are or how they treat you in return. Even with those who are not courteous back. All people. Again, Brother Jason this morning, even in First Peter, was just, again, the overlap is, is astounding often as I, I, I prepare week in and week out. Uh, let me just read these few verses from what we talked about this morning. First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you, as an, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. There's that Jesus is the example part of it. Verse 22 and 23. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but continued. Here's what we need to do continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Listen, let God be the judge of, what, of how we live. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to let God be the judge of my neighbor, even though he's being a jerk to me. I'm going to be courteous to him. Kill them with kindness. Again, go back to Romans 12 for that one. Pouring, heaping, heaping, uh, burning coals on their head by being kind to them. Remind them then to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle towards all people. So, so what? Listen. When Jesus called his disciples, he said, come follow me. What he meant was not just spend time following me around. 
though that was definitely a necessary part of it. Jesus was saying to them, and he says to all Christians everywhere, do what I do. Believe what I believe. Think how I think. Speak how I speak. Act how I act. Live how I live. By loving God and loving others for the glory of God. And the world will know you are my followers by your love because it will be like mine. Some will hate you for it and others will be drawn to it. You don't worry about those results. You follow me. So now here in Titus, God the Word, Jesus Christ, reminds us that part of what it looks like to, uh, of what that looks like is to show complete courtesy to all people, not slandering or insulting or, being, or quarreling, but ge with gentleness. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Jesus said this, Come to me, all who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Listen to verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus calls us to follow him and be like him, not so that our burden would be heavier, but to make it lighter. The Christian life, the Christ-like life, seems hard and laborious. But Jesus promises that our sinfulness is a much heavier load to bear. Come to Him. Learn from Him. Be like Him. That's where your rest will be found. So a couple of points of application here. There may be some of you in here that need to practice putting off insults. To put off speaking evil of others and being quarrelsome. Clearly, it's sin. Don't try to deny it or justify it. Call sin what it is. Come to Him. Come to Christ. Come to the Father and confess your sins. Ask for forgiveness and repent. Put it off. Turn away from that kind of living and instead put on what models Christ. Practice interacting with others gently and courteously. Keep your mouth shut more and listen to people. Learn to care about people. Learn, but mark. You can't really change that part of someone. Well, you're right, I can't. But God can. And if you are His, He is in you to give you the ability to change that the rest of the world doesn't have. And He expects you to change. So learn to be gentle. Practice it. It's something you can do. It'll take time. You learned how to be harsh and quarrelsome over time, and you got pretty good at it. And so you can do the same thing in reverse. Remember, repetition is how you learn. And the Spirit of God will work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Also, if, if and I know I've kind of made light of it to try to soften the blow a little, Listen, if that's really an issue in your life, you're not alone. You're not alone in this. Meaning, two things. One, you're not the only one that struggles with these kinds of things. It's not unique to you. That should give you hope. You're not the only person who deals with, with slander and quarreling. You're not the only one. But also, that also means you're not by yourself without any help. The Lord has given us one another. He has given us the church to help each other. So if you feel like you're stuck trying to handle this part of your life, come talk to me. Let's work on it. Or find a, a, a trusted, older, more mature Christian brother or sister that you can trust to help you, to keep you accountable, to change for the glory of God. Praise the Lord for His grace towards us. He will and does help us. This very verse proves that as well. Jesus is gentle and humble, and He shows perfect gentleness towards us, His people, as we grow and change to be more like Him. 
So trust him, follow him, and he will help you as you work with all his energy that he powerfully works within you. Our prayer should be, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God requires his people to be considerate to all people because that's what Jesus is like.